Good morning and welcome to Peak Alpha Strobe Light Show. I'm speaking in hushed tones because we are in a place that requires us to speak in hushed tones. We're outside the operating theater of the Trustwell Hospital and in a few moments we will be joined by our client, our next guest and neurosurgeon, Dr. K.S. Praveen. Good morning, yeah. Dr. Praveen. Good morning. Thank Anna you Kumar. for being on the show for, with us. Yeah, it's a pleasure for me yeah. too. It's, it's fairly early. It's 7.30. Is this how I don't know how you guys is? make it. It's fairly routine for us. Okay. So. Yeah. And how's your day looking? Is it packed? Uh, uh, today is packed like usual. We have two major surgeries planned. A lady okay. with a major brain tumor who's coming with uh, some problems. Mm -hmm. And then uh, most hospitals wouldn't touch her because it's a very, very risky procedure. Mm -hmm. And so we explained and then uh, we are going to be starting that surgery soon. We have another lady who was treated at another hospital for back pain and they could not uh, diagnose it on time. And then mm -hmm. it turned out to be an infection of the spine. Okay. We initially did the procedure of draining out the uh, pus collection and then today she's scheduled for the main surgery. So okay. hopefully they'll go well. Yeah, I'm sure they will. You know, I'm looking at this from a patient's point of view. Um, most patients when they are told that they have to go in for a surgery or their families are afraid. There is a mix of emotions, despair, hopelessness, anxiety, anger, why me? What kind of emotions do you have when you go into an operating theatre? Um, I would like to think that uh, I'm quite dispassionately attached to the patients. Okay. That's the most important thing. See, here we are professionals, but we are also human beings and then we do need to have empathy towards the patient. In fact, I feel what separates an ordinary doctor from a good doctor is that empathy that shows, mm -hmm. that is real and that is not fake. Mm -hmm. So that's the most important thing. When a patient walks in with a problem, we first, of course, we analyze it, we uh, recognize, we diagnose and we always already have a plan in our head as to what we will be doing for that patient. But when we talk to the patient's relatives, we have to understand their fears, their uh, uh, apprehensions. Mm. And they're also, as you said, hopelessness sometimes. The word brain tumor, for example, I'm a neurosurgeon. So the moment a patient is pronounced that he has a brain tumor, they do come with a thing that, okay, instead of uh, going to a lawyer for a will, I'm come to you. Mm. So that is the general perception that a uh, public has. So we, have, we are trying to change. And then last 50 years of neurosurgery has improved leaps and bounds. Mm. So uh, we try to pass on that experience. We try to pass on those good things that are being done out in the world, out in the lab. Uh, which somebody else has already had an experience, we try to bring that for that particular patient. Mm. You know, when all that comes together and the patient does well and there's a smile on his face, that's worth it for us. I love the term dispassionate attachment. But, you know, when I see you, when I first met you, you seemed so cheerful. <laughs> and I was thinking, how is it possible that a man who works in a hospital and hospitals are not the most happy places, right? How do you, how do you maintain this balance? See, of course, hospital, hospitality, I think they have to go together. Yes. Uh, but all said and done, uh, it is not just a place where you come and relax and unwind. Right. Uh, unlike other hotels or spas where you Correct. just go there for pleasure. Yeah. Uh, These patients don't come willingly to a hospital. Absolutely. They have come because they're forced to. We need to understand that. And as I said, we are privileged to be that uh, caretaker of that society who can not only understand this, who are in that unique position to even alleviate their pain and suffering to the next level mm. and make sure that we bring the best for that patient. So being cheerful is part of our coping mechanism too. Mm. In fact, we had uh, during our uh, MBBS times, we used to study this thing called as second year syndrome. Okay. The second year of our MBBS syllabus carries these uh, diseases that we read. Many a times we identify ourselves with that particular disease and we feel that we have that disease. But by the end of your career, I mean, by the end of your training, yeah. you already have formulated a particular pattern which identifies a disease. Yeah. It's not just a symptom analysis. Mm -hmm. We have to be professional and that comes with experience. Yeah. So a novice doctor, of course, uh, uh, is not uh, uh, privy to these kind of experiences, life experiences that they have had. Mm. To be cheerful is not only to reflect and to calm the patient down and allay their fears, but it's also a coping mechanism for ourselves. For yes. So doctor, did you always want to become a neurosurgeon? I'm not sure about a neurosurgeon. I wanted to become a doctor all the time. Mm -hmm. uh, of course, my uh, childhood, uh, I used to see my mother sick quite a few times. And then uh, she would say that I'll be your first patient. 
you please become a doctor. I don't know whether that has had uh, in uh, subconsciously it has pushed me to it. But I've always been interested in biology and the life sciences and the wonders of the human body. Mm -hmm. So uh, forever I've been wanting to become a doctor. Of course, uh, even during my PUC, I had my doubts whether I would be a doctor or not. But finally, I thought uh, one single person in the society who's more basic than an engineer is a doctor. <laughs> so that that was my uh, uh, mantra at that time. Mm -hmm. Of course, after I became a doctor, uh, I didn't know whether to choose surgery or uh, medicine. Mm -hmm. In fact, at that time, I was thinking that a surgeon can also be a physician, whereas the vice versa is not true. So that again pushed me to become a surgeon. And then I've always been interested in the brain and the mind and you know, the esoteric, you could mm -hmm. call it. Mm -hmm. And no other organ in the body is as esoteric as brain itself yeah. and the wonder of creation. So I think uh, neurosurgery came very naturally. Mm -hmm. too. You've been academically brilliant. Like I was just reading your bio. First okay. rank for MBBS, first rank in uh, MS uh, and uh, outstanding student for MCH. Uh, in fact, I've heard this saying, I don't know who, uh, if you love what you do, you don't have to work for a single day in your life. Uh, academic excellence, of course, apparently my grandfather was also very good in his studies. Mm -hmm. and, uh, I don't know. I have to thank my genes, my parents. And of course, there is this hard work and uh, persistence. Uh, but I think I've been fortunate enough to have the right people guide me. What, after so many years of practice, what do you think is the most essential quality for a neurosurgeon? I feel you have to be a doctor first. You have to and be a good means... doctor, whether you're a neurosurgeon. See, as you see our medical degrees, the first degree is the MBBS, which mm. is the basic doctor degree. And then you should never forget that you're a doctor first. And then see many people, most people don't come into your room and then say, I have a neurosurgical issue. Mm. They come in with an issue. And then you analyze, you diagnose. And then many a times, for example, a patient walks in with, it has happened. It's an everyday story for us. They come with left arm pain or neck pain or jaw pain and there are a multitude of uh, neurosurgical issues which can produce those. But when you see a combination of a patient who's sweating, who's tired and who has left arm pain, it is common knowledge that uh, he could be having a heart attack. Mm -hmm. You know, by being a greatest neurosurgeon, you will not diagnose it. You will diagnose it by being a doctor. So right. first you have that in mind. And second thing, uh, the patient can come into the room and then they're, they're very fidgety, they're anxious, they're looking all around and then the family, uh, the response is not so good and then the patient comes with a splitting headache. Mm -hmm. See, being the greatest neurosurgeon, all you can do is order for an MRI. Mm. But when you look at his interaction with the other family members and you notice that there are a lot of red flags in his behavior. Mm. It could turn out be a brain tumor, of course, but there are also a lot of family tensions that you can see. Mm. This you will notice not just being even a doctor, but just being a human being. So I think the message to become a good neurosurgeon is first of all, to be a good human being, then to be a good doctor. And then of course, uh, these days, uh, knowledge is available freely on the YouTube and multiple social media. A surgery being done in the America, you can learn and then you can reproduce it right here in Bangalore. Mm -hmm. And in fact, with robotic surgery, you can sit here and then do surgery on a person in America. But you are not there sitting in your room as the greatest neurosurgeon when a patient walks in, a human being, a doctor, and then a neurosurgeon. Okay, very nice. And how do you react to patients who come with a self-diagnosis after watching things on YouTube and Google? <laughs> Uh, I tell them, see, of course, uh, they, they are very eager to find out uh, and they are very eager to show off that they have done their homework. Some mm -hmm. of them, some of them do that surreptitiously, mm -hmm. you know, subconsciously they keep dropping <laughs> few hints that they have read upon it. Uh, but a lot more to medicine than just these diagnoses. Many a times we have to read in between the lines. I'm nice to them uh, because, see, they are doing it out of concern. Mm -hmm. They are not doing it to... Uh, be a one man up on me. I mean, they, they will never yeah. do that. Yeah. No patient will ever do that. Yeah. They've had to read up on the diagnosis and then uh, roll out their, those Latin tongue twisters in their mouth only because they've had a need for it. Mm. So as a doctor, you understand that. You smile at them and then their ignorance you bring out of it and mm. then you focusly just give them that knowledge that they require. Right. No need to be very preachy about it. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so I've heard you mention tumors and you this morning when we were talking. What has been your most challenging surgery so far? There have been quite a few. Uh, there have been, uh, uh, I, in fact, I remember a 
two and a half year old child that I did a couple of months ago. This child was operated for a brain tumor elsewhere in another hospital just mm -hmm. about a month and a half ago. And then the surgeon referred the child to radiation. Mm -hmm. And I don't know whether he felt that it was not resectable, not operable. And then uh, 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 on doing the scans again, I found out that uh, about 2% of the tumor was removed out of the 100%. And it mm -hmm. was a very, very critical location of the brain. Uh, pressing on the medulla, pressing mm -hmm. on the consciousness center. The child was hardly awake. The child was hardly able to stand or sit. And then it was very, very drowsy. And the mother, there's a first child and then uh, the mother was inconsolable. And then we chalked out a plan. We did an initial procedure to drain out the fluid of the brain to reduce the pressure in the brain. And then we planned this major surgery. I knew that uh, this surgery is going to be very challenging because mm. it's a small child. Even mm. a blood loss of 50 ml will be very, very great for the child. And it's a small brain, a small head and then delicate structures already operated so that th that means that the brain and the tumor will be stuck to all surrounding tissues. And then I open and then see that the surgeon has done a very small opening of the bone. Mm. And then we had to extend the bone work and then the tumor was stuck to all important structures. So slowly and carefully we started going around the tumor. Initially it uh, appeared to be a mountain and then gradually when we started working around the tumor and then the tumor gave itself to us mm. and then we were able to remove it completely and uh, we were able to replace the bone with a mesh and then the child did extremely well and it turned out to be a, one of those low risk cancers of the brain and then uh, hopefully the child is now at least two uh, maybe six months post-op and mm. then it's doing very well and then you could see initially the child was very drowsy in the ward not even able to talk to you and just by the time of the discharge and the chemotherapy had started the child was running all over the ward and it was a life of the ward mm. it brought smiles to so many of those uh, uh, children so mm. sometimes you feel that uh, uh, every patient is just a candle ready to be lit yeah, there are I'm many sure. such uh, yeah. uh, surgeries that we have done and yeah. each of them is yeah. very yeah. satisfying you told me a little bit about your foundation the trust fell and also Please tell us about the Trustwell Hospital itself. You're not just a doctor here, but you're also a part of the foundation yeah, team. I'm extremely proud to be part of this hospital. See, uh, unlike any other corporate hospitals which are run by managers who don't really deal with the patients in the way that doctors do, this is a very, very unique uh, venture mm -hmm. where uh, we, a group of like-minded doctors who wanted to bring that experience of having dealt with patients and for the best uh, uh, benefit of the patient we also decided to sit in the management chair mm -hmm. you know uh, for about five or six years we sat together there were some doctors who hopped in hopped out but a group core group remained. continued remained and then after about five years of thinking uh, we came up with this hospital in fact one of my directors uh, came up with this name and then i i feel it aptly suits the motto of this hospital, a trust well hospital where uh, you can, you know, trust the advice of the doctor mm. to, you can just blindly go with it and then say, okay, the doctor will do the best for us. A group of doctors uh, who have brought up uh, this hospital is now fourth year in its running. And then um, uh, we are doing extremely a good amount of work. In fact, the latest addition to our, of course, we have uh, taken a very active part during COVID. Mm -hmm. And uh, it has a rare distinction of having served as the largest number of uh, mucor fungus, black fungus cases operated in the second wave during wow. the, it was a, uh, an epidemic during the pandemic mm. and we have done the largest number of uh, such surgeries it's a combined effort it's a team uh, trustful really stands for what a team can do mm. and the latest addition is the series of uh, organ transplants that we have done mm -hmm. we got our uh, transplant license just recently and then uh, we have already done a couple of them and then uh, uh, thankfully they've all done well so uh, recently we did come up with this trustful foundation mm -hmm. uh, it's a charity venture mm -hmm. where we seek donations from uh, uh, patients who have done well as well as other uh, people of the society who can contribute and then uh, we have used this money to help a uh, lot of uh, patients who can't afford even mm. a single uh, meal for the day and who have uh, these uh, diseases which are uh, possible to cure mm -hmm. except for the lack of finances. Mm -hmm. We feel that nobody should be denied medical care because they can't afford, afford it. it. Mm -hmm. I think that is the motto of uh, uh, that should be the motto of any government also. Mm -hmm. uh, of course we are doing a little bit whatever we can.
Right, yeah. Switching back to the health part of question, which I'm sure lots of laymen will want to know. Um, neurological disorders are, most of the times I know, they just happen. Or are they caused by lifestyle? Uh, yes, they do. Uh, most of these, uh, uh, say there are certain non-operative neurological disorders like say migraine, mm. tension headache. And uh, of course, you, you may be born with a tendency to develop those disorders, but many of those are caused. Mm. Uh, lifestyle, like you say, say, is the commonest cause of your backache, your neck pain, your spondylitis that you know, spondylitis that you call it as. Uh, wear and tear of the bones and the discs and the nerve compression, pinching mm. of the nerves, all these are aggravated and caused by lifestyle diseases. There is chronic tension, headache, uh, migraines which are aggravated by lifestyle, say staring into the screen, mm. sitting hunched back in front of the system. These can affect many of these disorders the patient already has, mm. li like fibromyalgia is a myofascial syndrome with neck pain, back pain and uh, the uh, pain between the shoulder blades. Mm -hmm. These are known to be aggravated by stresses, mm. emotional stresses. So, of course, uh, the I f get frequently asked whether frequent mobile usage can or stress can produce brain tumors. Mm -hmm. Of course, nothing has been said conclusively. And uh, if uh, stress could produce uh, brain tumors, and then I think neurosurgeons will be first in those lines <laughs> treating themselves. That is not true. Okay. It has not been proven in surgical studies, mm -hmm. uh, nor is the phone usage linked to brain tumor causation as such. Nobody knows what causes it. A lot of research mm -hmm. is going on. Mm -hmm. But there are a lot of these neurological disorders which can be prevented. Like say alcohol, for example, producing shivering of the hand, Mm -hmm. or uh, stresses or imbalance. So many of these neurological disorders are caused by excessive use of these uh, substance abuse mm. uh, diseases also. Right. As a neurosurgeon, what are three things that you would never do which will cause damage to your health? Uh, I would never sit in a single place for more than half an hour in the same posture which will put a lot of strain on your neck and back. Mm -hmm. And uh, of course, the second thing is I do develop uh, escape mechanisms, mm -hmm. uh, coping mechanisms around me uh, to deal with the stress of my everyday life. Yeah. We are called in to see almost brain death patients. We are called in to certify brain death and breaking these uh, sad news, uh, grief to the family is one of the harrowing experiences that any human being can have. So we have to equip uh, ourselves with the mechanisms to not only uh, deal with these everyday emotional stresses, but also the physical stress of uh, each, uh, an average neurosurgery lasts for about three or four hours. Mm. I think uh, a lot of this comes from a sense of, uh, you know, uh, in Sanskrit, we have this term called as Thita Pragnate, mm -hmm. Thita Pragnya. So you have to be conscious and present in that, uh, that uh, moment, moment mm. and then discharge your duties, you know, dispassionately. Nobody would uh, remember that you operated for a 14 hour surgery and then m many people might not remember after a few days, but your family will. Mm. They will remember that, that your daughter's birthday, you were not available because you operated on a 14 hour surgery. surgery. So giving family time and then giving that importance to your social circle around you is the most important thing. Stress busters, you don't have to go to a bar to drown your misery. You just yeah. come back to your family and yeah. then they're there to yeah. deal with your stress, you yeah. know. So these three things, I would hold them very, very dear to my life. As I said, coping mechanism could mean art, could hmm. mean music. I, I practice Carnatic classical vocal. So I think uh, music has been my haven. Mm. has been my go-to place whenever I'm, sometimes I do that in my mind when I'm operating. It mm. takes the stress away from me. Yeah, and you're a, you're not only a trained musician, but you've also given performances, I hear. Uh, yes, I have. That's, uh, I don't want it to be a thing of the past, but right now it looks like it's the thing of the past. I used to uh, give. Of course, uh, right now, neurosurgery takes up most of my time and 24 hours is not enough to deal with uh, mm -hmm. uh, this uh, very, very exacting uh, science of uh, medicine. Mm -hmm. The music is always with me wherever I go. I sometimes play it in the car, I sing along. I mean, if somebody watches me through the window at a signal, they might think <laughs> I'm going mad, I'm talking to myself. You have to make do with whatever time life gives you. And there's a, there is ample time provided uh, you prioritize your things properly. Yeah, it's wonderful. I love the fact that you, you gave us two special words today. Dispassionate attachment 
and also how you bring about a sense of balance in your life yeah the the, the beauty of the social network you don't realize what you have until you lose it mm. so you start looking around you just be in that moment and then uh, i think being thankful to what you have uh, far supersedes what you don't have in fact many a times I, i i use that a lot in my practice where i tell my patients my patient may come with after 3 months of physiotherapy and then losing say a limb to paralysis and then they they don't have a particular function of a limb to its 100% they keep harping about that hmm. 20% which is not there i said what are you doing with that 80% you already have and that seems to bring them back to reality and then say no doctor i will try to do that today and then i'll help and then i'll force myself to uh, you know to uh, help uh, those myself faculties. and uh, yeah. the society around us and then there is a lot of things that you can do with what you have mm. and in fact they say that we are hardly using about 10% of our brain power so that is the power of our brain and then some people tend to use more and some people lesser uh, so but uh, there is a lot more capability and the brain is very plastic there is something called as neuroplasticity mm-hmm. where if a particular function is lost the brain has a tendency to recover that through the surrounding network of neurons similarly in family also so this importance of family importance of social network i cannot just over emphasize having experienced one myself i think that's the most important thing a person needs to have to preserve his sanity absolutely yeah and also the fact that we must focus on what we have and not that's, what we don't be thankful i think yeah, and gratefulness and yeah uh, but i also have to ask you one question that i ask everybody who comes on the show is that how did you hear of pkafa and how have we influenced your life or affected your life pick alpha has been a part of my life for a really long time mm-hmm. now i remember those days 2009 to be precise it's been about 14 years now and uh, in fact uh, those days i was just finishing my i just finished my mch neurosurgery from nimhans and then i was so financially ignorant i mean uh, it, it does happen to many doctors too i i'm proud to say it on camera mm-hmm. uh, i had not even filed my taxes till that time Mm. and then that was the first time that of course i had a pan card and that's it <laughs> <laughs> i was so financially illiterate when i was receiving my super speciality degree i mean that is the uh, irony of it yeah. and uh, i was introduced to peak alpha by my uh, co brother mm-hmm. and my sister in law my wife's sister they were with peak alpha for, for some time and mm-hmm. then there was a, a very special need in the family that i had to pitch in and then mm-hmm. i had to take a look at my finances uh, there was a little emergency in the family that's when i was sort of uh, jolted to reality and then uh, priya has been a really great friend guide and mentor in this particular field of finances and then i'm really happy that uh, part of my growth story success story goes to peak alpha where uh, she really set the uh, goals in front of us mm. in fact the first time she said do you have any life insurance i said my only life insurance uh, policy that i bought was because my sister in law forced me to buy a policy and then that was a very small amount and at that time lic was i mean the norm mm. so when she okay. said see it is for insurance is not an investment that is the first word i heard from finances insurance is a safety net yeah. it is for your family to continue living the same quality of life that they will lead even when you're not there and that sort of jolted me back and then she made sure that uh, my insurance was covered my medical insurance was covered my goals were set and then uh, my uh, daughter's you know expenses uh, were planned for the next say 10 15 years until her post graduate education mm-hmm. my retirement plans were set mm-hmm. in fact these were the uh, first time that i even heard those terms mm-hmm. and then uh, i'm happy that while i'm sitting and working here my money is working there too and peak alpha is making my money work in fact i'd like to add say uh, when we planned trustful for example trustful mm-hmm. has been an integral part of my life and then we've been planning for this me and my colleagues uh in fact uh, we we knew for sure that we will not be able to take out a salary for the first few months or mm. even a year after establishing this place because uh, we would need those funds to you know run the place itself we would take some time to break even and the business models were something that we were very very new to so priya helped me uh, 
plan my finances for that time. And then uh, she said, oh, no, Dr. Praveen, you can go ahead and then plan out your good you're good to go and then as long as you are bringing in only so much money for this many months you will be able to go ahead and then fulfill your dreams mm. please go ahead and then do mm. you know with that confidence that i could carry on uh, taking care of my family and my other uh, personal expenses is what gave me the confidence to go ahead with trust yeah but thank you that's that's so inspiring i'm going to yeah. take back all these words and i'm sure our audience is also going to be really um, inspired by what you do and um, these three tenets of a happy <laughs> life. Thank you so much. No problem. It's been a pleasure to be part of and then just talking about in fact, uh, while I'm talking to you, I'm also reflecting on my life. I mean, yeah. uh, uh, I'm just thinking I'm just thankful to uh, my thought processes and thankful to the raw material that God and genes have given me. Yes, of course. And uh, uh, to be happy and thankful to the people I've come in contact. There's mm -hmm. this principle in physics, I forget the name, mm -hmm. where it says uh, when two things come into contact with each other, there is a little rub off of this material onto that and that, that material onto, onto you. Yeah. I'm happy that it's happening between us too. Yeah. And then I take home uh, whatever the questions themselves are rubbing off on me and then it's letting me yeah. contemplate and, and introspect, yeah. you know, and then uh, I'm really happy to share this experience. Thank you. So there you have it straight from a neurosurgeon's mouth, how to remain healthy and wealthy. Health like wealth is a very intentional goal. Whether you want to become a neurosurgeon, want to stay healthy or wealthy, it's a journey of small steps and everyday practices until you reach your goal. And you know, at Peak Alpha, we love goals, setting them for ourselves and for our clients and achieving them. We'd love to hear about your goals too. Write to us at hello at peakalpha.com. You can also check out our socials in the handles mentioned below. Until next time, take care and stay safe. Thank mm -hmm. you.